I'm in week number two of a sermon series entitled Intentionally Intention, Living in the Sweet Spot of God's Truth. Um, the premise is this, that in God's word, the Bible, as you read it, you may notice uh, you'll come across truths in the Bible that seem to be competitive, um, like competing truths, almost like contradictory. Like you read one thing and then you read another thing and it's like, now how can both of those be true? And the problem is like a lot of non-believers use that as an excuse to reject the Bible, reject Christianity, and that's unfortunate because they don't understand it. But even more, there are a lot of Christians who don't take the time to like study that out. And I understand that because it's not always easy. Like how do you study that out? And... Uh, and so I, I decided after 20 some years of pastoring, I just needed to take some of these on. Because even myself, as I'm reading through the Bible, it's like now, okay, I, I know this is God's truth. I know this is God's truth. They don't look like they match. <laughs> they don't look like they work together. And there's times when I've just kind of glossed over it, like, oh, but I don't have time to study that out. Because I'm I gotta, I'm gotta do this. And so I just kinda push it to the side. And I think we probably all do that, right? And even I do that. But there's times like, okay, time out. I gotta, we gotta figure this out. And so, uh, honestly, I, I've been kinda putting off this sermon series for a while because I knew it would take a lot of study. And I like studying for uh, a sermon message. I enjoy that part of what I do. Um, <laughs> But I know this would like take, this is, this is not gonna be easy. And the Lord a couple weeks ago just said, okay, it's time to do it, like, okay. And so I've been doing that, I've just really enjoyed. And I'm, I'm not here to say like I've, I've nailed this, but I, I, I think as we take time to study God's word, we, we can see the truth that, that's there and how they're not competing, they're not contradictory, we just have to understand them. We have to see them in the context that it's written, and context is king when it comes to studying the Bible. And here's something I learned in Bible school a long time ago that didn't make sense to me at first, but it, it says you use the Bible, uh, use the context of the Bible to understand the context of the Bible, right? We, look, we always have to keep the big picture in mind, and you can't just cherry pick a verse here and a verse there because you can make the Bible say anything you want if you cherry pick it, and you can't do that. You have to look at the big picture, and honestly, there are some things that I'm gonna take either to my grave or to the second coming of Jesus that I'm not gonna understand. I, so I'm not here to tell you like, oh man, I got it all figured out. Like, I, I don't. But I'm, I'm learning and I'm sharing what I'm learning with you. And because uh, I think it's important that we understand um, how these truths live in tension together. And when I talk about that, that word tension, usually that's not used in a good connotation, right? Usually when we think of tension, we think of something bad. Like there's tension in, in the family or I have a tension headache. Like that's not good. But tension is valuable and needed in a lot of instances. I spent a lot of years in the broadcast industry and, and in radio towers and TV towers. Tension is what keeps towers standing up. You see the guy wires coming off of broadcast towers, right? They're in tension. In other words, they're there's tension between them pulling hard in equal and opposite directions to keep the antenna straight. If it weren't for tension, those broadcast antennas would not last long. They'd be, they'd, the wind would take them over, <laughs> in, and especially in Montana, wouldn't take long, right? And so this idea of tension and keeping, like tension in, in barbed wire fences, you need tension to keep animals in. Tension is a good thing, can be a good thing. And so these truths that we're studying about are actually held in, in tension, right? Like, okay, there's a sweet spot in there. We're not on one side or the other side. We're like, oh, here's my favorite truth. I think I'll, I think I'll cling to that truth. <laughs> but you can't just pick your favorite truth uh, and, and at, at the, at the, uh, ignoring the other one, right? You got, okay, how do we live in that sweet spot there? Because if we don't live there, we're gonna miss a lot of good things of God that God has for us. And, uh, and we would be out of balance if we didn't do that. So, and so in this sermon series, we're gonna look at this kind of two competing truths or seemingly competing truths um, that maybe we haven't understood in the past and how they complement each other, how they bring things into sync, 
in our life with God. And so here we, here we go, uh, week number two. Uh, two truths that live in tension. Talk about the law today. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of competing, seemingly competing Bible passages I could read. I'm, I'm gonna read a couple. So here's one, Romans 3.31, right? Because we always ask, are we under the law or what? Are we under the law or not? Romans 3.31 says, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all, rather we uphold the law. So you read that like, oh, so we uphold the law. We're gonna talk about what the law is uh, more specifically in a minute. Romans 6.14 though, so you just go a few chapters later in the book of Romans, it says, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Like, okay, Paul, make up your mind. You said we uphold the law. That, this is not what that says, we uphold the law. Romans 3.31. Romans 6.14, no, we're not under the law. How can both of those be true, right? And I think Christians have, have struggled with that a long time because we don't take the time to really study that out. Um, because the question is, are we under the law or not? Well, what is the law? <laughs> if you look in the dictionary uh, under law, it says an orderly system of rules and regulations by which a society is governed. All right? Societies and organizations have laws, rules, regulations, structure. God's a God of structure, right? And so there are rules and regulations, when you start reading the Bible, this is the Old Testament especially, like there's a lot of rules and regulations there. One of the things I wish someone would have told me when I was young that I, um, that I didn't understand, I understood um, there was an, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I understood that Jesus was a dividing line. Okay, I got that. What I didn't understand is how how do we relate to the Old Testament, also known as the Old Covenant? Covenant is agreement, right? There's an old agreement with God and there's a new agreement. Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. And sometimes you start reading in the Bible, especially like Leviticus, and you're like, what? I can't eat shrimp? Because <laughs> no, sell, shellfish, right? Not selfish, shellfish, can't eat shellfish. There's like a lot of these rules and regulations. Um, like men can't trim the hair on their temples. Well, that's, that's about the only place I can grow hair, so I guess I'm okay, but uh, that would look, look kind of weird. Uh, so you start reading that stuff like, like, what? And of course there's the 10 commandments in the book of Exodus, so we know those, right? Well, most people do, or at least you heard of them. So in, in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, there are basically three types of laws, all right? These, what governs God's people. There's the moral law, uh, which the 10 commandments would be a summary of the moral law. God, God has eternal principles, right? Like don't kill other people, murder them. He's not talking about armies and wars, but don't murder other, don't just, and don't have sex with people you're not married to, and don't lie. And don't, um, don't steal, and you know, all, so you, there's 10 commandments. Like those are eternal principles, a moral code. So there's the moral law in the old covenant. There's also ceremonial law. A lot of like, okay, I want you to take uh, this bread, but don't put any leaven in it, don't put any yeast in it, and eat this and have some herbs, and when you do this, eat this, but don't eat that, and... Um, I want you to celebrate this on this day by doing this and blowing trumpets and I want the priest to come in to their sanctuary this way and only certain people can come in here. That's all under the old covenant. It's ceremonial law. Ceremonial law did a couple things. Number one, it, it, it was teaching people to be holy. Holy basically means to be separated from the carnal world and for use by God, right? You're special. That's what holy means. You're separated from sin to live a holy life. And so part of the ceremonial uh, law was to help people get that because they'd been in, under Egyptian pagan gods for 400 years. The ceremonial law, every ceremonial law 
in the Old Testament points to Jesus in the New Testament. That's really was the biggest reason for the ceremonial law because they're, they're teaching them through specific actions and things. Like there's the Messiah who's coming and he's going to fulfill all these foreshadowing events that we're doing now. That's why we're no longer under the ceremonial law. We don't have to do all those things because Jesus fulfilled that. He is that. We just worship Jesus now. So he, we're Jesus people because Jesus hadn't come to earth in the old covenant. And then there's the civil law, which regulated social behavior, civil behavior, like laws, like if you um, accidentally kill your neighbor's ox, here's how you, um, how you pay that back. <laughs> or if you do this, you do that. And it had a, all these laws because the people of Israel, again, when, when they went into captivity, originally it wasn't captivity, but when they went into Egypt, with, uh, when Joseph was there, um, they, there was 80 people. The nation, when they went into Egypt, 80 people. When they came out, it was about 2 million, 400 years later. So the nation of Israel really grew in slavery, in Egypt, in captivity. They didn't know how to govern themselves. They just did whatever the Egyptians told them to do. So, so God, as he pulls them out into the promised land, he has to have like, here's how society kind of runs. And here's how it's going to run with you guys. And so there's that civil law. So when you start reading the old covenant, again, especially well, Exodus and Leviticus, it's like, man, do we have to do all that? Well, it's called the law, but it says we uphold the law, but then it says, well, you're not under the law, so we, we kind of got to figure this out, right? And then and you've heard of the, maybe you've heard of the Torah. Um, Torah is a Hebrew word, literally means law. And there are some Christians that call themselves Christians, well, we only go by the Torah. It's like, uh, well, <laughs> but we're under the new covenant. Um, not saying the Torah is not important, it is important. The Torah is considered to be the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? That's the Torah. It's interesting though, the law, the old covenant law didn't come into effect until halfway into Exodus. Like there's a lot, there's thousands of years, probably a couple thousand years of human history from creation to Abraham, or well to Moses actually, where there's no, it's, there's no, law. There's no Ten Commandments. The law wasn't there. The law didn't come in until Moses, which is about, about 1500 BC-ish. There's a lot of history before that. Abraham wasn't under the law. There was no law. I mean, God had laws, so I guess in that sense there were, he had edicts and things he wanted people to do and not do. But the law, the law, as we would know it, the Mosaic law didn't come in until till Moses. Um, I guess let me just summarize it as this. The law can be as general as any command in the Bible by God, or it can be as specific as the Ten Commandments. So sometimes when people speak of the law, they're speaking specifically of the Ten Commandments. Sometimes they're, they're speaking of all the laws in, in the Bible, Sometimes they're, they're, they're speaking of just the old covenant, which didn't happen until the middle of Exodus. So it, it kind of like, well, what do you mean by the law? Well, we kind of mean this old covenant thing, but if you think summarized by the Old Testament, um, Ten Commandments, most people would say that's the law. Do this, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. That's how we kind of think of the law, kind of. Um, but Romans 6.14 that we read says that we're not under the law, but, gr but we're under grace. Grace, and we teach this a lot here, but let me just remind you, grace is God's favor along with his supernatural empowerment to do what he's asked you to do. So when, when God gives us grace, he gives it to us out of favor, like we haven't earned it. You don't earn grace. He just gives it to you. It's unmerited. 
but it also empowers you to do what he's asked you to do. So, how do we, how do we match those two? What, are, what does that mean? Well, before we, let me just twist the knot a little bit more before we go on. Can I do that? Can I just twist you up a little bit more? <laughs> I'm gonna, so hold on. Uh, Romans 2.13 for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. All right, so we just read, remember we're just picking one verse here, but there's one verse in Romans 2 says, if you obey the law, you'll be declared righteous. And we're like, gulp? Am I obeying the law? Hmm, we better obey the law. But then... Read Romans 3.20, one more chapter down. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. What? It just said, I'm, I'm declared by obeying the law. I'm declared righteous. Declared righteous by obeying the law. I am not declared righteous by obeying the law. Does that seem like contradictory? <laughs> All right. You re- should we unwrap this a little bit? Please say yes, because we're going to. Um, <laughs> let me go back to Romans 2.13. Let's tell you what's going on here. Again, context, right? Context. You can't just start picking out one verse. Because if you start picking out one verse here and one verse here, here's what you get. Confusion. You get like, I don't have a clue. The Bible's whack. I don't want to read it. I don't get it. A lot of people are there. I was there for a lot of years, so I was one. Um, Romans 2.13, I'm rereading it. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. All right. In the Old Covenant and in Jewish tradition, they would read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the law. They would read the law every Sabbath in, in their gathering. All right. They would read it. It's one thing to hear it. Are you actually doing it? Because the law is good, like don't do, don't do bad things. Do good things, all right? That's the law. And so they would read it, and it's like, you guys, I'm paraphrasing, because Jesus basically said this, you guys hear this every week, but very few of you are actually doing it. You're doing all this self-righteous stuff on the outside, but on the inside, he said you're like filthy coffee mugs who haven't been washed out in weeks, months, years. Weeks is okay, but never use dishwashing liquid, just a tip. So, anyway, but he said, like, in the inside, you're not, you're not getting it. It's not enough to hear things. You actually have to do things. James, James talks about that. Um, so here's what, here's what Paul is saying. Because this is, so Paul's writing under the new covenant, right? Jesus already came, he's died. He said, we have a new covenant, there's a new agreement, it's, you're, you're saved by grace. You're not under the law. And what he's saying is, in Romans 2.13, it's perfect obedience to the law. The only way to be declared righteous by the law is to perfectly obey it. He's getting their attention. Because they're like, uh, they might say, oh, we perfectly obey it. They say that on the outside, but on the inside, they're like, oh, I don't. I don't obey it. I, I don't know if I can. James 2.10 says this. This is New Testament. He says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Gulp. So, basically what the Bible is saying, okay, you want to be declared righteous by the law because that's what they were saying, right? That, that like, we're righteous by the law. Because we, 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 we're awesome at doing it. Just watch us. That's what they were saying. <laughs> and the, the Bible says, um, like if, according to the law, if you break one of, just one thing, you break all of it. You lawbreaker. I'm not a lawbreaker. Yes, you are. <laughs> what he's trying to, he's, Paul is trying to show them the situation they're in. Fine, because they're like, they were rejecting this grace thing. They're rejecting faith in Jesus. Like, just let us do our thing. Let us follow all the rules. And that's how, we, that's how we're declared righteous. And Paul, 
you, but you're not doing it. And even if you tried, you, you, can, you can't do it. Nobody can do this perfectly. Well, except one, Jesus, and he did it. He fulfilled the law, but nobody else can. So, back to Romans 3.20. Therefore, therefore, so he just talked about, you can't do this. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Why? Because you can't do it. If you could do it, you would be declared righteous, like Jesus was. But you can't do it, so quit trying, because you can't do it. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, the law, by the law, become conscious of our sin. The law makes us aware of our sinful state. It's, it's the law that makes us wake up and go, um, perhaps I'm not as awesome as I thought I was. <laughs> we teach a lot here, God thinks you're awesome. And he does. But he also knows that we mess up. He knows that we cannot live perfectly no matter how hard we try. And, and it was become a, that trying to be righteous by your own good works, Jesus said, like a heavy yoke. It's like a burden that you can't carry. And he says, when you follow me, my burden is light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. I come to take that off. He came to take off that burden of religiosity, of the law. So the law makes us aware of our sinful state. If you were not aware of your sinful uh, state, you don't see a need for a savior. That's, that's, what the, uh, that's what this is about. You, Paul is trying to get the people to the point of this truth, like we need help. We need a savior. So here's a few other things Paul wrote. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you have been saved, right? God's favor, through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so no one can boast. He's saying, you're not saved under the new covenant by behaving really good, really well. Well, really well. Where's my English teachers? Help me out here. You're, you're saved because of God's favor, when you, when, you, when you put your faith in Jesus, God's favor saves you, makes you righteous. And we teach that a lot here. Romans 3.28 says, "For we, and this is Paul teaching again, he's still teaching on this, therefore, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. You are not justified by the law. Justified means... Um, Declared not guilty. What Paul's saying is, no matter under the law, no matter how hard you try to be good, the verdict is always, always, always going to come back guilty, because the law does not grade on the curve. Well, I did. I've done better than most. <laughs> That's what a lot of people think. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty good compared to other people. Yeah, but compared to God's righteous standard, you, you, you you're not. And, and so we've, we've failed that. So we, we need some help. We need a savior. Um, apart from the works of the law, because that's we can't do it. <laughs> so many verses in the Bible talking about this law grace. And, and yet, the law is there. There's some value to it. But we're not under it. So... <laughs> Let's bring some understanding. I've got five points here this morning. Hopefully, take all the loose ends, kind of tie them up a little bit. Here's number one. I think I've got to start here. Salvation has always come by faith. I'll start right there. Even in the old covenant, people were saved not by following all the rules and regulations. That never saved anyone. Salvation is and always has been because of faith, always. Um, Old Testament believers made animal sacrifices for their sin, but they did it in faith 
that at some point the Messiah would come and take their sin away. So Old Testament believers who really knew the scoop, and many of them did, understood that animal sacrifices just covered their sin. It didn't take it away. And that at some point in the future, a Messiah would come and take their sin away. That's why when John the Baptist came announcing Jesus, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was a big deal because they knew that their sin had not been taken away. Their sin had just been covered. The word atonement literally means to cover. That's what it literally means, atonement. Um, it doesn't mean taking away. Jesus came to take our sin away, not just cover it. Genesis 15, 6. This is Abraham, before, they call, before Jesus changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And this is before the law. So this is pre-Torah. Uh, well, it's in the Torah, but it's pre-Old Covenant. Um, and, and God's telling Abraham, hey, I'm gonna make a mighty nation out of you. I want you to move to this land far, far away that you know nothing about. You don't know anything about it. I want you to go there and I want you to start a nation. And out of that nation, it'll be blessed. And that's where the savior came out of that lineage. And we're grafted in that. That's a whole nother story. Um, and then it says this in Genesis 15, six, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. In other words, God credited it to Abram as righteousness. It's like Abraham wasn't declared righteous because, because he did everything God said. He was declared righteous because he believed what God said. Does that kind of make difference? Now, we should, we should obey God, right? Right? We should obey God. But there's times when we mess up and we don't do it. But you can, you can still believe God and trust him. We still mess up. That's, the, that's kind of like our life, right? Same with Abraham. That, so Abraham was saved. He was declared righteous because of his faith. That word believed doesn't mean just heard God. It means like I hear you and I believe you. So I'm going to do it. I'm gonna do what you said because I believe you. That's faith. It takes a lot of faith to move a thousand miles away with camels into a place you've never been <laughs> because a voice told you to, but Abraham did. That's called faith. So salvation has always come by faith. It was never animal sacrifice. It was never obeying the law. Number two, but okay. <laughs> But that's not saying the law isn't valuable. Okay. Number two, as new covenant believers, we live under grace, not the law. We do not live under the law. We live under grace. You need to know that. That's a, that's a main tenet of the, of the new, new covenant and almost the entire message of the book of Romans. Um, because of our faith, we live in God's favor and empowerment. So instead of following a, a list of written rules and regulations, we're empowered by God to do the right thing. He favors us and empowers us to do that. More about that in a minute. But here's an important one. And here's what help, what help will tie this. Number three, without the law, grace is meaningless. All right, because you're like, what's the big deal? Paul seems to be making a big deal of the law. Like, it's, it's important, we need the law. Paul says we need the law, it's important. And then he says, but we're not under the law. So here's what I'm saying, without the law, grace is meaningless. Why would we need God's favor and empowerment if we could do it all ourselves? If we could, if we could live perfectly righteous, why would we need God's help? We wouldn't, right? We need his grace. I need God's grace. I need his favor. I need his empowerment to even attempt to do what he's asked me to do. If I try to do it on my own, I can't do it. But even if I could, let's say I could, why would I need him then? 
I wouldn't. So we need the law to understand grace. Does that make sense? Because that's, that's huge. So when we talk about the importance of the law, it's, it's not important in the sense because we're under it and we better know it because we're under it. No. One reason it's important is because we need to know why we need God's grace and favor. Because there's still this moral code. Well, uh, well, let me talk about that. <laughs> we, just, we, we need a savior. Um, here's a big problem. A lot of people think they're good enough without Jesus. Even some who call themselves Christians who don't know Jesus, which there are plenty of those in the world, but people who aren't Christians, um, like why, why would I become a Christian when actually I'm better than most of the Christians I know? And they have to go to church on Memorial Weekend. <laughs> right? Like, I'm, I'm pretty awesome compared to other people and I get to go camping. And they gotta go to the meeting and I'm better than them. Come on, you know that happens. A lot. People think, they might not say it, some do actually, because I've heard it, but a lot of people think that. Why would I, why would I go? Especially in this community where we have, we are blessed, the community we live in, in this larger area, I would say almost the whole state of Montana, there are the nicest, greatest people in this state ever. And in these communities, the drawback is like, then why do we need Jesus? Like, we're all good, right? We all take care of each other. We're all there for each other. We all support each other, which is largely true, largely. It's like, why do we need Jesus? Like, if you want to do that, fine, but I don't, because we're, we're all pretty good. And that, that's a problem. Because they, all, when it comes down to, one of the things, it's not the only thing, one of the things, they don't understand the law. They don't understand God's law. When you don't understand God's law, even though we're not under it, then you don't see a need for Savior, you don't, need, you, don't need, you don't see a need for grace. Which means, brings me to this point number four. By upholding the law, we are proclaiming that sin is bad, holiness is good, and we need a Savior. There it is. That's why we need the law. Can, can you remember two, three things? Sin, Bad. Holiness, good. We need a savior. If you, that's why we have the law. Because if we didn't have the law, the Bible says we wouldn't know that sin is bad. We wouldn't even know what sin is. We need to have the law to know what's wrong. Right? Even though we're not under it, we need to know it. <laughs> I hope, I hope I'm connecting enough dots here. Um, Romans chapter seven. <laughs> a lot of people read Romans chapter seven. It's like Paul is like, I'm, I'm such a mess. And they never read Romans chapter eight. I'm taking a little sideline here. Um, like Romans chapter seven, Paul is saying, I'm a wreck. Things I try to do, I don't do. Things I know that are right, I should do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do do. And people read that and say, well, see, that's Paul, so we're okay. But you got to read Romans chapter 8, everything in context. Because <laughs> in Romans chapter 8, he goes, thank God, literally, for the Holy Spirit. Because now I am declared righteous. Now I am empowered by God's grace to do the right thing. So he's com contrasting trying to live under the law with the living under grace between Romans 6 and 7. So he's, he's fleshing that out. Romans 6, uh, 7, verse 6. But now, by dying to once what, uh, what once bound us, let's talk about the law, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would have not known that what coveting really was if the law had said, you shall not covet. 
It's like it makes us aware of our sin. Okay, I feel like I need to say this. <laughs> you are not to live thinking about your sin. You are to live thinking about your new life in Christ. All right? We preach that a lot. I just feel like I need to say that. I teach this a lot, but there's always new people. Jesus is not interested in fixing your sin. He's interested in you living. If you live your new life, you won't generally sin. If you try to fix your sin, you're going to make it worse. Like, Jesus is like, I'm not fixing up your old junker. I'm giving you a new one. We're called a new creation, new life in Christ. That's why we thought that'd be a great name for a church, right? New life in Christ. Paul says, consider yourself dead to sin and alive in Christ. And so like, I'm dead to sin. I'm living for Christ. As if I live for Christ and, 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 and by what, number five, what we're going to talk about in a minute, then I'm... I'm doing way better than I ever could trying to fix the junk of my old life. So Paul says, you're not under the law, but you need the law to know what sin is, to know that you need a savior, to know right from wrong. But you don't do it by trying to work harder at the written rules. So how do you do it? Number five. The old covenant law established a moral code. Yay. And under the new covenant, we live by that code by yielding to the Holy Spirit. There it is. Well, let me just read it. <laughs> Romans 8, 3, and 4. Now we're in the, in the good chapter of Romans where Paul's like getting it. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh he wasn't sinful, but in the likeness of that, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We're not living according to the law. We're not under the law. We're under the Holy Spirit. Difference between old covenant, new covenant. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in every believer 24-7 under the old covenant. That's why they had that. We do. When Jesus died, resurrected, went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. Actually, and this is like Pentecost Sunday, uh, where we celebrate Acts 2-4, where that happened. Every believer has a Holy Spirit. So now we can follow the Holy Spirit. Here's what Galatians 5 says, starting in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit... Yield to the Spirit, live in the Spirit, follow the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. But they are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You have two choices of how you live. If, if God is your God, are you going to live under the law or are you going to live under the spirit? You, they're not both, right? As new covenant believers, which you are, we live under the spirit. 700 years, six, 700 years before Jesus even came on the scene, the prophet Jeremiah spoke the words of God, spoke through Jeremiah and, he, and God said through Jeremiah, he said, there's, in this new covenant, I'm paraphrasing, in this new covenant, I'm going to write my words, my laws on people's hearts, not on, um, not on tablets of stone, but on hearts. Galatians 5 says, <laughs> listen to what I'm saying, if you follow the Holy Spirit, you will not sin. Now, am I saying we don't sin? I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, if you're following the Holy Spirit, if you're yielding to the Holy Spirit, you will not sin. 
So why do we sin? Because we don't always follow the Holy Spirit. I'm there. There are times I do something like, oh, and the Holy Spirit like, Mike, what, what, are you, what are you doing? Like, oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you for forgiving me. Because what I, if I do something or sometimes not, it's because I'm not following the Holy Spirit. I'm not yielded to the Holy Spirit. I'm just kind of doing my own mic thing. I'm, I'm living out of the flesh. And that's really this, not battle, but it, it kind of is. It doesn't have to be as much of a battle as we make it between the flesh and the spirit. It's like becoming a little more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not transparent. Uh, we're, will, we're willing to kind of make ourselves vulnerable. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. It feels really vulnerable to yield to the Holy Spirit because our default mode is to call our own shots. Our default mode is let the flesh call the shots. And that's, that's kind of how we've lived most of our life. When we give our life to Jesus, accept him as Lord and Savior, put our faith and trust in him, believe what he says, and the Holy Spirit comes into us now, it's like, okay, now maybe my flesh needs to like just chill out a little bit and then I need to, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? And when we follow the Holy Spirit, we will not sin. But sometimes that flesh is like, something grabs us, right? And we just have this like, oh, sorry. Thank you for forgiving me. I'm back with you, Holy Spirit. That's how we're to live as new covenant believers. <laughs> I'm so, so thankful to be living under the new covenant to have that burden of the law lifted, where I don't have to try to, number one, even remember all the laws, because there's way more than the Ten Commandments. Like, if you start going from there, like, and, and trying to think, did I do that right? Did I do that right? It's so much easier and more effective just to listen to the Holy Spirit and let Him guide and direct me. When I do that, I, I find I don't take offense to things. I don't speak ill of people. I have a lot more joy, and peace. But when I don't, when I start getting in the flesh, I, I lose that, I lose my peace, I lose my joy, I start taking offense, I start carrying around unforgiveness. It's like, ah, what am I doing? Flesh, you're dead. I'm living, I'm living under the spirit. So, do we live under the law? No. Do we, uphold, do we uphold the law? Yes, in a sense, it's important in our life because we know there's a moral code. We know that we should be living a holy life. We know that sin is bad, and we know that to live the way we should live, we need Jesus as Savior. We need the Holy Spirit. I hope that clears, I hope that helps connect some dots for you on this law versus grace thing. Are we under the law or are we not under the law? Because there's Christians like, oh, nothing, have nothing to do with the law. Well, like, that's not biblical. And then there's other Christians like, oh, it's all law. Just, man, you gotta do the feast. You gotta do, you gotta do all the Jewish thing. Like, no, the Colossians says, don't, don't do that. Live under the Holy Spirit. You'll do the right thing. Really? When you take all the law Old covenant, new covenant, whatever, it's the law. It's all about living in right relationship with God and other people. That's what it's all about. I mean, look at, just look at the Ten Commandments. It's all about your relationship with God, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and relationship with other people, your parents, your friends, other people. You're called to live in right relationship with God and other people. You can't do that on your own effort. You need the saving blood of Jesus and you need the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're here this morning and you've not ever put your faith and trust in Jesus, 
I implore you to do that. To do what Abraham did is to put your faith in him, to believe what he says. Do you believe what Jesus says? What does Jesus say? Well, he says, unless you're born again, you'll not see the kingdom of heaven. That's what he says. <laughs> um, will you die to your old life and live your new life in Christ because Jesus wants that for you? If, if that's you and you say yes, that's faith. You're saved. You're declared righteous. But then you've got to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you yielding to the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in the Holy Spirit? Yes, it's awesome that you're not going to hell. You're going to heaven because you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Two thumbs up. Great. But there's a lot of, there's time that time and the time you meet Jesus face to face where you live here, where you need to yield to the Holy Spirit so you can live a life of holiness, turn away from sin, have a life of peace, hope, and joy. That's what Jesus wants for you. And I hope you receive that today. Why don't you stand as we close this morning?